All right. Um, so, I mean, to be honest, the core of this class, the core of this class of, of STAT 507 is, uh, right, all the different kind of um, tabular approaches to categorical analysis, these various chi-squared tests, these, uh, you know, Pearson and, and so on and so forth, Cochrane, Mantle, Hansel, sort of the first half of the class. And then logistic regression and then those tweaks on logistic regression, the second half of the class. Um, but it turns out we have a little bit of time left over. So Poisson regression, important technique, something we covered last week. Um, although again, it was kind of more just kind of in, an introductory primer. Um, this week we're going to have an even broader, more big picture introduction um, to a, a pretty complex way of analyzing data. Um, it's sort of the next level of generality um, going beyond those generalized linear models. And so um, because of this like increasing level of complexity, this is just a very broad exposure to introduce us to some ideas and some terms that we probably haven't encountered, certainly not in any of your classes that I've taught you. Um, so that when, if you do encounter them in future classes, you maybe feel a little bit more comfortable, or perhaps, um, you know, if you encounter them um, down the road, um, in the workplace, for example, you at least have like enough of an idea um, that you can that you can seek out the appropriate resources, right? That you know the right thing to Google, you know the right book to look for, um, to to at least give you like a little bit of a basis um, that if you need to, you could build upon. So these generalized estimating equations, these GEE models, extend what we talked about last week by allowing for the possibility of correlation within data, right? One of the big assumptions that's underlined a lot of our modeling techniques so far has been this independence assumption. And of course, there are plenty of real life situations in which the independence assumption is violated. GLMs are one way of, of approaching that. They also allow us to get by without having to specify a distribution. So we don't have to commit to saying, ah, I think it's a normal distribution and I may or may not be right. I think it's a Poisson distribution and I may or may not be right. Instead, more broadly, we just specify a relationship between the mean and the variance. So like what are type, some of the types of situations where you might use this, particularly focusing on this idea of correlated data? Um, so, so one possibility um, would be uh, multiple measurements over time. Um, this is often referred to as longitudinal studies. So, right, maybe you take a sample of like 100 patients and you measure those patients' blood levels, um, say every month for a year. That means you have 100 patients um, and for each patient you have 12 measurements. So that's 1,200 observations, but right, 12 of those well, you have groups of 12 that are all in some way potentially dependent on one another, right? Because your blood level today probably in some way depends upon what your blood levels were last month. Um, so, so that type of situation is referred to as a longitudinal study. There's something similar, right? Time series. Time series is looking at things where you have only kind of the same idea. You're, you're looking at something over time. But unlike a longitudinal study where you might have a hundred observations being measured over time, in a time series analysis, you have a single observation, right? So maybe your single observation is um, maybe the, the stock price for just a single stock, um, maybe maybe Apple stock, um, you know, and you're looking at that stock price on a daily basis or maybe a weekly basis, right? That's what we would call a time series measurement. Uh, but you also can have this idea of like kind of... Um, cluster correlation um so maybe you're doing like an in, like a like educational study and and you've like have a large sample uh, and and students in your sample some of them all come from the same classroom so maybe there's some inherent dependencies there right students that come from the same class students that have been exposed to the same teacher 
probably have some dependencies, right? That is, if one student knows a particular topic, it's maybe more likely that another student from the same class might also know that topic because it means the teacher covered it and or covered it well. Right, there of course might be like genetic dependencies. So, you know, if we're looking at litters of, oh, how cute, uh, adorable putty, uh, puppies, you know, there might be some genetic uh, dependencies there. And sometimes I, I, I do in class like an example with this like speed dating data set. And so speed dating data set is a, you know, they paired, um, is heterosexual pairing, so a male and a female, and um, ask them questions about the person they were paired with. And there might be some dependencies there, right? I mean, I do think there's a certain kind of, um, I don't know, reciprocity, is that the word for it? That, you know, if someone is like really into us and digging us and just, you know, having a good time, it maybe makes us a little bit more inclined to also be into them and in, in, in digging them. I don't know, that may or may not be true, but I think it's possible. So, so lots of examples, right? Lots of examples of where we might see correlated data. Examples that we've kind of avoided by and large um, because our, our modeling approaches um, aren't, aren't really structured to deal with them. And so we're finally getting a little bit of exposure in a core class to kind of deal with. There's certainly other things. We have an elective, for example, on longitudinal analysis often taught by the great Professor Gallup. So, right, that would go really deep in the kind of doing this longitudinal type studies. Um, I occasionally teach um, an elective class on time series analysis. So that would be another um, way. But we're gonna talk very briefly about this other method, um, generalized estimating equations. Yeah, right. So we so we know independence is an important assumption of, of everything that we've kind of studied up till now, um, and and having these correlations violates this assumption. When we don't account for um, this dependency in our data, we get inaccurate estimates for our standard errors. Um, and of course, so like all of our inference is based on our standard error. So that means that our confidence intervals are wrong, our p-values are wrong. It means our decisions are wrong. So unlike the, the, the generalized uh, linear models from last week, um, we do not have to specify an exact distribution. Uh, it's another sort of nice little side benefit of these GEEs. Instead, we specify just these two link functions. So the first links the mean to the explanatory variables, and we're just going to focus on, yet again, this linear combination of explanatory variables. And the second, as implied in a previous slide, is some function linking the variance to the mean. So how do the mean and the variance relate to one another? In logistic regression, right, we know, um, so uh, the mean, right, that g of pi, um, or sorry, what we're modeling on the left-hand side of the equation is that g of pi, so that's the log of pi over 1 minus pi, and then the, the how is the variance a function of the mean, that function is um, 1 minus pi, so the variance Remember, in logistic regression, we're dealing with a Bernoulli random variable. For a Bernoulli random variable, the variance is, um, oh, I take that back. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm right. Uh, the variance is pi times uh, 1 minus pi. Uh, for Poisson regression, what goes on the left-hand side of the equation, right? We know this from, uh, from last week's lecture. Is, is that log of lambda. And then in this case, that, that V function is just the identity function, right? The, is, is the variance a function of the mean? Yes, it is. The variance actually is, in fact, it is the mean. So that's our identity function. So the actual formulas for these GEEs are very technical. Um, and require knowledge of things like score equations, quasi-likelihoods, right? These kind of pretty big picture theoretical stuff that are very applied program, um, you know, there's only so much time, um, unfortunately overlooks, I, I think in favor of things that are more valuable to us um, to succeed and excel in the workplace. Um, but because we don't have these things, we can't really um, go into a lot of depth as to what's going on.
but we can talk about kind of this important idea of if we're going to use these things and we're going to use it in particular to model dependencies or potential dependencies, we need to specify a covariance um, slash correlation matrix. And so this matrix is a way of describing or modeling um, the potential cluster or subject dependency within our model. And so this is from our textbook, page 492. Um, it's four of the more common ways. There, there are others on top of this. Um, but let's, let's talk about maybe a situation where you have, um, I don't know, maybe it's like a longitudinal analysis. You're taking blood um, at four different time points. And so how might you model dependency amongst these time points? Well, the, the first possibility is, right, independent. So um, the, you might say, okay, well, I think that there is no relationship. I, it's probably naive in this case. It's what a lot of our previous modeling structures have been assuming. But in a situation where we do have, right, observations taken from the same person at four different points of time, probably there is some sort of dependency, in which case the independence is not the right way to go because that's assuming that there is no dependency, that all your observations are independent. Um, the other ones, which we'll, we'll talk about these in their own slides, so maybe I'll just name them really quickly, is um, sometimes re referred to as exchangeable, um, perhaps a little bit more commonly it's referred to as compound symmetry. Um, then we have autoregressive, order one, and then we have uh, unstructured. Yeah, so we talked about independent. Basically means that the observation at any time point I is independent of all other time points J. And that means there's nothing to fit. We probably don't need these generalized estimating equations. But it also means, right, if there is in fact correlation, that using this covariance structure is the wrong thing to do. So the next sort of level of complexity is um, this compound symmetry. This says that there is the same non-zero correlation between all time points. So that is, the correlation between time points one and two is the same as the correlation between time points one and four, same as the correlation between time points two and three, and so on. So right, maybe all of them have a correlation of 0.5, maybe all of them have a correlation of, of, of negative 0.3. So here there's only one parameter that we're fitting. Right, so in the independent, we don't have to fit anything. Here with compound symmetry, we're we're fitting just a single um, a single correlation um, that we're perhaps naively assuming fits all possible uh, pairwise correlations, which of course may or may not be true. Something a little bit similar but nuanced is this idea of autoregressive correlation and in this idea we have this idea that correlation um, between time points degrades over time so we're still just fitting one parameter that is like this sort of base correlation it's the correlation for time points separated by just one time period so similar to compound symmetry, we still just have to estimate one number, which is nice. So maybe, for example, that number is 0.5. And then we see this correlation degrade. So maybe the correlation um, between time points 1 and 2 is 0.5. And then the correlation between 1 and 3 is 0.5 to the power 2, which is 0.25. And then the correlation between 1 and 4 is like a little bit weaker. That's maybe 0.5 to the power 3 or 0.125. And it keeps having and having and having and having, right? In our example, we only have four time points. But imagine where you have more time points, 5, 6, 7. That correlation is starting to get closer and closer and closer to 0. To me, that's a little bit more intuitive, right? That is, there's maybe a strong correlation between observations very close to one another in time. But the farther back we go, to me, it makes sense that there's this lessening dependency. 
So autoregressive, I like better. It, it is primarily only relevant in situations where we're looking at time dependencies. So like cluster dependencies, like students within a classroom, it's maybe less appropriate. But when we're talking about time points, I think it makes a lot of sense. And then finally, we have unstructured. So unstructured, right, is complex in the sense that you're you're saying that that every possible pair of time points can potentially have its own correlation. So it gives us sort of a lot of flexibility in terms of like being able to model our data, but it also does give us six different things that we now have to estimate ideally correctly. Right, so do we kind of see all these different time points here? So here we're estimating six different things. The correlation between time points one and two, the correlation between time points one and three, the correlation between observations from time points one and time point four, and so on. So four different common approaches to modeling correlation. Now, it turns out it's not a huge deal to try to to try to make sure that you get your correlation exactly right. Um, even if we misspecify our, our, our correlation, our parameter estimates are still consistent, right? Going back to our whatever it is we're modeling. Our model parameter estimates are still con consistent. That means they converge to the actual um, parameters. The, the estimators converge to the actual parameters. Um, Right, as our sample size gets larger and larger and larger, assuming that we correctly specify the mean variance relationship. In terms of sample size requirements, we typically talk about sample size requirements in terms of clusters. Right, so in, in how many clusters we need depends upon how many variables we're putting into our model. For just a handful of variables, just a couple, 25 is fine. But once we get into that 5 to 12 range, we want like 100 to 200. So what do I mean by cluster? I mean, you know, maybe your clinical study has 100 patients. Maybe for those 100 patients, you take 10 measurements. So our data set has 100 times 10. Our data set has 1,000 observations, but we would think of our sample size as just 100. We have 100 clusters of observations. So again, very big picture, I know. Um, but let's look at an uh, example. Um, this, is, this is involving passive smoke, uh, passive smoking, so that's secondhand smoking. And so the study looked at 25 children, followed them over time, followed them at the age of 8, age of 9, age of 10, age of 11. And basically for every child at every, at every age, they just said yes or no. At, over the course of this year, were wheezing symptoms present, yes or no? And, and the, the independent variables that, that, that the researchers wanted to put in the, the model was, of course, age, uh, city, so, so different locations. I want to say two cities. Um, we'll, we'll see. Um, in just a second, when we look at the output, and then and then passive smoking zero one two. I believe that variable is the number of parents um, that smoked at home, right? So it could be that that neither parent smoked, one of the parents smoked, or both of the parents smoked. So that's that's what's being measured there. So in terms of model specification. What's the most appropriate? Well, our Y variable is wheezing symptoms, yes or no. So that sounds to me like logistic regression. Now, in terms of modeling correlation, we have, we have um, for every cluster, for our 25 children, we have four observations for each child. Let's, as an example, look at something that's used very commonly in practice, and that is the compound symmetry. We can do GEE in GenMod, and we do it by using something called the repeated statement. The repeated statement is what's telling GenMod that we have these clusters in which there might be some dependencies.
In the repeated statement, there's a subject equals option that specifies our clustering variable. And there's a type equals option, which specifies the correlation structure that we would like to use. And then we can do a type three statement to request um, that the tests of individual scores be done using something called a score test, which is different than the walled test, which is what's done by default. Again, very technical. The differences for large samples are going to be very close to one another, but for smaller samples, they can diverge. The score test is more conservative, and as such, it's recommended to use that score test, um, particularly in situations where they diverge from one another, i.e. smaller samples. In the model statement, we use the link equal option. Um, to do that first, that first link, the G of mu, and then the dist equals option will essentially specify um, that variance link. So here's some code, um, right? Proc gen mod. Still have that class statement. There's our model statement. So the link is the logit function. The distribution is is binomial, so that's what we use for Bernoulli in this case. Bernoulli is just a very right, special case of the binomial. And then there's um, the type three will get us that score test. Um, the repeated option, right, is what's sort of new, and that we use subject equals ID, right? So there's an ID number for each of our kids. So it's basically saying any observation that has the same ID number should be in the same cluster. And we want to model any dependencies with that compound symmetry. So here's our output. Uh, yep, looking at that city variable takes two possibilities. And I have a feeling this is fabricated data. I think I think it is part of the textbook, but I don't know. Green Hill sounds very uh, very country, right? And and Steel City sounds very urban. So I have a feeling this is like a generic kind of. Uh, testing urban versus a uh, rural example um maybe it's just like uh maybe who knows maybe it is real data but they just uh came up with some fake names for the cities they sampled from to protect the innocent um all right so we can see some summary information here Now notice, right, this is very nice. I talked about we try to we try to estimate this correlation matrix, I called it. And we can see you may or may not have had linear algebra. You may or may not be familiar with the concept of a matrix. But we can actually see this four by four matrix, right, under that working correlation matrix. The rows and columns are are representing different time points. So when you cross-reference a row by a column, you could think of that as the correlation between the time point for row one or the time point for the row and the time point for the column. So right, the diagonals, for example, row one, column one, that's like the correlation of time point one with time point one. And so an observation is perfectly correlated with itself, which is why we see a one there. Row one, row two is the correlation between um, observations from time point one and time point two. So we see that correlation is estimated at 0 0.0883, so a weak positive correlation. And then, right, again, the compound symmetry assumption is that all correlations are the same. And so, right, not surprisingly, Row one, column three, that's the correlation between time point one and time point three is also 0 0.09, 0 0.0883. And the correlation between row one, column four, that IE, right, the correlation between time point one and time point four is also 0 0.0883. All of them are. That's how the that's how the exchangeable, the compound symmetry um, approach works. If you want to play around with that data, you could you could you could see what that matrix would look like if you put the autoregressive in there, if you put the unstructured in there. And then where it it tells you the one coefficient that it's estimating, that correlation which is presumed constant 
or um, common for all uh, time point combinations is estimated a little bit more accurately there, 0 0.0882, blah, 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 blah. And then we have our model equation down below. And our model equation, right, is is presumably making, is using better standard error estimates because right behind the scenes, SAS is utilizing this correlation structure. And then here's our type three test of significance for our variables. We see actually in this thing, um, that city is, is nowhere near significant. So there doesn't appear to be any um, differences in wheezing symptoms. Um, age is something that we're controlling for, um, right? In terms of just correlation, it's probably actually not a variable that we're interested in, um, like significance for, but it, it does appear non-significant. And then smoking, right? Um, uh, technically non-significant, but very, very close. So perhaps worth, um, looking at a little bit deeper or, or maybe following up with some further studies, um. Yeah, so uh, the bottom of the previous slide shows our estimates and the p-values. Um, this part of the model should be interpreted just in the same way as logistic regression. That is essentially, that's what we're modeling. We're just building a logistic regression model, just one that, you know, has, has a specified correlation structure. Which means odd ratios, predicted probabilities, all could be generated and interpreted in the same way. Uh, so, um... Right, for example, we could exponentiate the parameter if you go back to the model equation and look at smoking. Smoking was the one that was technically non-significant, but very, very, very close to significant. So something we might be interested in looking at further. If you look at the model equation, um, its parameter estimates 0 0.6506, we could exponentiate that and get 1.9168. So what does that mean? It means, um, well, I wrote it one way in that bullet point, you could read that. Um, maybe a nicer way of reading it is like for every one unit increase in smoking. So for every additional adult in the house that's smoking, we expect the odds of wheezing to increase by 91.68%, right? So we still use these things um, it, just as we always have. All it's differing is kind of, you know, how SAS is generating these things behind the scene. So that wraps up not just this week, but it wraps up this class. Um, so we have, what, just probably some sort of final ahead of us. Um, yeah, and then I, I guess we'll be rolling into the holidays. So um, until I see you again, be brave. Stay wild.